Uh, I'm John Frixell. Most of you know me already. Um, if you don't, uh, nice to meet you. I'm sure we'll get a chance to get to know each other well. Um, Luke had mentioned to me an option to, uh, in association with the meeting, to discuss kind of new ideas and to kind of plant the seeds about what uh, I'd be interested in doing while I'm here. And so that's what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's something that I worked on off and on for you know years, really. Um, and that is that in movement ecology, we're often you know preoccupied with the, the locations of individuals or populations. But I'm going to kind of pose uh, you know a slightly different approach, and that is that the subunits that are of interest are really the groups of individuals that are associated in space. And I'm going to show you data to kind of suggest that that's you know, a very important principle, at least in relation to the system that I work in, in East Africa. And I'm gonna put it in the context of how group formation fits into uh, uh, trade-offs between foraging opportunities and the risk that individuals face. And I'm gonna pose a kind of one general way of linking these things together and hopefully excite you guys a little bit about um, the opportunities about uh, where we might uh, put this into a, a mobile kind of movement uh, framework. So the notion starts from the supposition that's you know very fundamental ecology that if you're a herbivore, you're kind of between the devil and the deep blue sea uh, in that you're trying to acquire energy. At the same time, you're trying to avoid becoming a meal for a predator of some sort. And so if we're going to think about fitness, we have to kind of tend fitness between these two constraints. That is that uh, the individual fitness that an individual faces in a population of a given size um, is gonna be uh, related to the contrast between the foraging gain that they obtain. And we're gonna think of this as being kind of translating energy into fitness uh, outputs, balanced against a loss term that's uh, predation risk. So in each of these cases, we're talking about a density dependent kind of measure of Malthusian fitness. And we're gonna, I'm gonna pose that this, this fitness is scaled to the size of groups that you find yourself in and show you that there's some sort of general uh, relationships that we can uh, use to build that fitness. Now, if we think about the foraging side of things, uh, I'm gonna use an example of species of gazelle that I've worked on a fair bit over the years. Uh, and we studied this in Serengeti for uh, about 20 years ago, we spent about five years uh, looking in some detail at the foraging rates of the uh, tops and gazelles. We did experimental work uh, to look at how the cropping rate was related to the amount of food that's in the environment uh, by constructing artificial uh, grass swords on, on uh, boards. And so we would plant uh, uh, gra grass uh, uh, individuals of a particular height and uh, vary the biomass in that way. And what we found, uh, not surprisingly, is that the grazing rate is an accelerating function of, uh, sorry, of a positive function of biomass, but it saturates pretty nicely uh, encapsulated in a type two functional response. But we also, at the same time, measured the quality of, of these grasses. And also not surprisingly, uh, taller grasses are poor nutritional quality because the only way that can be erect and stand tall is by having lots of lignified tissue. And that lignified tissue basically dilutes the uh, soluble parts that an animal can digest. And so you have this trade-off where the rate that you acquire food is a positive function of, of the amount of food that's out there, but the quality of the food that you can obtain from it is a negative function of the food that's out there. And so if you think of multiplying those two together to think about the net energy that you would obtain, then that net uh, energy is a, is a uh, dome-shaped function in this case, because there's a non-linearity in it that gives you that sort of, uh, otherwise it would be just a straight parabola. So fitness then from, in terms of foraging is this dome-shaped function of the amount of grass that's out in the environment. <clears throat> fitness is energy gain per day. We have a way to translate that into per capita rates of growth uh, it, based on allometric relationships. But in any case, we're going to say that fitness is uh, based on that kind of energy gain. Now, in assessing kind of how that might play out, um, 
we would like to apply this across the larger landscape. So we have this 4,000 square kilometer uh, study area that we work in in the middle of Serengeti National Park. Uh, the uh, study area is kind of roughly consistent with that rectangle you can see. And all the red squiggles you see in this map are tracks that uh, we can drive along to uh, uh, measure things. And so we record densities along a set of these tracks as a measure of, of spatial uh, location. And so the way that we do this is we have a team of people that drive along the track. One of those tracks is shown here. And we have a perception zone. In our case, it's artificial. We limit it to 100 meters on either side of the car uh, because we know that there's a decaying ability to sort of see things beyond that uh, distance. Uh, but uh, within that zone, we count all the groups of individuals that we encounter. So groups are shown by the circles, numbers of individuals in the groups shown by the diamonds. And so we have uh, an estimate of both the, the density of individuals that we see in the given track. So that's the n is equal to 13. And we have an estimate of the number of herds that are encountered at the same time. So how do you make sure that you encounter not the, you don't have this at the same time, no? You don't have an area of the ground. How do you know they belong to different herds? We presume that they are uh, social groups that are meaningful here. We're not worrying about whether they're, you know, kind of whether they have long-term association. That's all we're interested in is the snapshot of the uh, subset of groups that we, that we occur, see in space. Okay. Now, if we do that, then, then at the same time, we're measuring grass biomass every, every kilometer or so. So we have measures of both the quantity of, of grass that's out there and also measurements of the density of individuals. So if we lump all those data together over all these transects uh, month by month, each of these panels corresponds to a, uh, a smooth distribution of the grass biomass in this case. So you've got uh, 16 different monthly snapshots of grass biomass as we sample it. And the heat map then shows you that there's uh, obviously a lot of variation uh, relative across the ecosystem. And grass biomass tends to be in the upper left-hand corner. That's because of the gradient of rainfall across this, this savanna. A year. Uh, it's actually eight different months in two different years. So, yeah, so it's uh, these are all during the growing season. Yeah, I don't get bothered. I'll show you maps of when, when there's no growth, it's all kind of uniform. There's nothing very interesting to see. Yep, spatial domain is the same, and it roughly corresponds to the 4,000 square kilometers that I talked about. So mapped against that, this is what the distribution of the gazelles is over in, across those, those uh, 16 months. And what you can see is, once again, you know, quite a lot of aggregation and densities across the system, so they're not kind of evenly spread. And they're definitely not spread in such a way that they're concentrated in the upper left-hand corner of, uh, of the plots. Um, so they're not going where the grass is most abundant. Um, but thinking back to the fitness curve that I showed you guys earlier, that fitness curve is a dome-shaped kind of function. And it's actually centered pretty close to low values. And so what this suggests, and what I'm going to kind of corroborate in a second, is that they're really kind of finding the, the middle ground where grass biomass is, is uh, not missing entirely, nor where it's super abundant, but somewhere in the middle, intermediate levels of grass biomass offers the best trade-off. Yes. Yep. Uh, no, we travel over the whole area. Yeah, yeah, we're able to sample the whole area. That's not a problem. Yeah. I mean, when I say there's a, a high grass biomass, biomass is like this, okay. A low grass biomass is like, in a, you know, one of the lawns here in a college, you know, so flat that you can, you know, uh, you could roll a ball across it easily. So here is a fit if we kind of take all those binned observations and average uh, relative to the grass biomass that uh, you see in a, in a particular spatial location. The uh, locations that we observed in terms of Thompson gazelles is shown by the, the solid dots. And the, uh, our estimate of the daily energy gain that you obtain in a bin of that type is shown with the, with the uh, open triangles. So pretty good corroboration. I mean, it, you know, it suggests 
you know, that our experimental work uh, does a pretty good job of informing us which of the cells we're actually seeing uh, our Thompson gazelles in. So we feel like that's kind of encouraging to us that they are paying attention to energy and that that energy availability is, is uh, predictable in some sense across the landscape, despite the fact that there's a lot of stochasticity in both uh, the uh, maps of, of the resources and of the locations of the animals. So we think there's a pretty strong case that these animals are, are moving around in a way that's guided by resources. Sorry, no. Yeah. Can you put the animal bars around some of those? Oh, they would be actually quite tight, just because there's so many observations. I mean, it's, it's not as though this is a, a crude kind of depiction. So in that sense, so that, I mean, the last two data points are not following. Uh, no, that's true. They're not following out this. But if, if the extreme, this is where we have the least data also. So you're, I mean, your point's well taken that if we put error bar, probably there is much to learn from this, uh, the right-hand side. So all I'm really trying to say is that knowing something about food on the in, on the landscape helps us to inform where animals should be, and that it should be varying over time. Predation. Yeah, without considering predation. Without considering predation. All right. So the low biomass without considering. Yeah, that's right. Everything else being equal. So. Well, you don't necessarily have to. I, I mean, if all you're interested in is, is predicting where animals go, we already have a pretty good predictor of where animals go. But what I'm suggesting is that if you want to understand the dynamic consequences of where you go and how you move over time, that you also, also need to think about the distribution of the individuals as, as they're moving, because I'm going to show you that that is influenced by uh, the grouping pattern. Because from the beginning, my objective in kind of doing spatial dynamics is not just to understand where things are, but rather what are the consequences of those choices. That is, how does it translate into population dynamic interactions? That's that's why I'm a movement ecologist, is really because the ecology. This is based on This is not question in physics. This work is based on possibly explicit data. Yeah. 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 Uh, long term, yeah, I'm working on the, the carnivore side of things, but yeah, but yeah, I've made a fair bit of. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but um, but yeah, I've been working on the carnivore you know, response to all this too. So. If you remember how we did the observations, we were not only interested in where things were in space, but also the grouping patterns. So that is how the number of herds relates to the number of, of, of individuals that we see. And so we generate a size distribution of uh, groups. Yes, and we accumulate all those surveys. Uh, so these data are based on 84 monthly surveys now. So we're talking about quite a few observations, several thousand observations of groups. And here are nine uh, predominant species that we see in our, in our surveys. What you see in the, the dots are the observed values been uh, with respect to group size. So on up to, uh, in some cases, 100 individuals. If we talk about Cape Buffalo, on up to 500 or 600 individuals if you talk about wildebeest. Some of the others are much smaller. Um, in the case of Topi, up to 40. Uh, in the case of Waterbuck, a quarter would be the max as well. So, the uh, John, sorry. Yeah. This is like cross entire. This space. aggregate data. This is aggregate data on quite a number of animals. All space and time. So, over eight years of monthly observations. And now, but this is just because you're putting as a function of the group size. You have sort of associated with you to mention the beginning part. Nope, the groups, these are the things that we see. So this is the, uh, these are the, the size of groups that we see in our 100 meter by 100 meter by, you know, 100 by 200 meter pixels, basically. Okay, I don't know what you're going to say later, but the point that you are assuming when you see, then, because you already asked about the association, it doesn't matter itself. But now, if you are plotting this, you are giving importance to Group size and then how many they are, the frequency. Then maybe you have to be sure that 
is that individual belong to this herd or is it swapping back and forth? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna postulate they don't belong to any herd. That, that is basically a, a, a very uh, transient kind of distribution, and that it's going to be a, a fission fusion process does a very good job of predicting what we see. So that they aren't associated permanently. In some cases, that probably isn't true. Like water pump, I would say that probably is is arguable. But all, in all the others, if you watch them, it's quite obvious that they don't stay as one coherent herd. I mean, I've seen 500 buffalo clustered around my house on one day um, in 20 years of experience. I've never seen that again. That's clearly not, you know, the regular social group. I mean, it, it is one realization of the social process, right? That, um, if, you, if you properly follow the European season, then develop on some of the country. Um, in, yeah, in no sense, it's one population. So it's a re this oh, it's reorganization of, of the whole population to, to small groups sampled in space. Not in yeah, yeah. Well, it depends what you mean by not independent. I would say in this case, we have a universe of points of, of individuals that are scattered across an ecosystem. We're sampling them in space in a manner that, that uh, you can treat as a random sample. Then the month or but those individuals, the odds of those individuals being located within 100 meters of our track is extremely small in 4,000 square meter study area. It's a point sample. They don't sit and live in, in you know, one tiny little area. I guarantee that. I guess it depends on your, what, how you drive this data. And then it's forward, no, because you know, again, you know, you know, you're doing point samples, this thing mix up and so on later on. So maybe get to wait well, for your next slide. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, whether that's crucial or not, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting question. Um, all I'm saying is that, that I'm looking for a distribution of what's out there in terms of the, the uh, sampling from the population, even if it is. A static distribution that change even if you saw this every single month so then we play it wouldn't matter this would what i'm saying it's basically all i'm interested in is what the distribution is whether it's a completely mobile population or not but i'm going to suggest that it's consistent with the general explanation yeah no problem no, uh, we can't. I mean, I, I have, I'm not doing that here, I, but I have looked at a monthly to some degree, <clears throat> and it varies quite a bit in some species. Obviously, you know, during the migration period, the willoughby's come in in huge numbers and then these big disperse. Uh, so, you know, there are changes that happen month to month for sure. Uh, but we're, for this, I'm going to ignore that. Okay, the, I guess what I'm trying to show though in, in this diagram is that uh, I've shown exponential and, and power fits to these data basically. And, and you know, they both do a pretty good job of, of capturing at least the decay kind of, you know, phenomenological kind of shape. They're not much different. So there isn't a great deal to be said. So in some cases, the power curve is slightly better. In some cases, the exponential curve is slightly better. They more or less balance out, and the differences are very small. So I'm going to suggest that if that's not really a major consideration. I thought it might be a lot of fun to kind of zero in on that, but now that I've thought about it a little bit more, I don't think it's all that interesting. But it might have some potential if somebody's particularly interested in, you know, um, you know, fine grain kind of distribution kind of properties. And if they are, great, I've got the data. So let's now think whether a general process can kind of explain that. And so the, there's a fission fusion model that was developed by uh, Shai Guerin and, uh, and, uh, and Levin in 1995. So, you know, this is pretty old stuff. It's very cool. It's kind of based on constant probabilities of splitting and merging of, of, uh, of particles in space that are occurring in, in herds. So this is based on coalescence theory. So a kind of long chain molecules and the probability that they'll fractionate 
and if those uh, molecules come in close enough contact that they join together. So the uh, basically the uh, dynamic system itself is predicting the changes in the frequencies of, of each of those bins of, of uh, occurrence. So you know x would be the size of a, a, a particular uh, you know, group size anyways in the larger population. And that there is a kind of a, um, a process that gives us a dynamic kind of change in regards to our starting conditions. So, for example, I start the model with one single herd that arrives in the middle of Serengeti, which is not too far off of what happens with the Willoughby's during some years and some migrations. Over time, it degrades into uh, negative exponential. And that ex negative exponential is what essentially I showed you in that previous previous diagram. So I'm going to kind of argue that's kind of you know uh, at least to first to principles kind of argument that that's maybe not a bad way to characterize you know uh, the distributional properties at least of the sampling that we've done. That sampling is based on several thousand observations of, of individuals uh, over and over. Uh, over different uh, conditions. And it seems to apply pretty nicely to, you know, the set of nine species that I showed you, which are all pretty different in their ecologies. So, is it reducing or increasing? Sorry? This, this pattern, the, this is the outcome of it. it, 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 it I'm showing you basically, if you run a simulation over time, it's converging on the, on the equilibrium, which is, which is a, which a negative exponential. To change according to the language. Uh, no, maybe the other across all. Oh, it's maybe the stationary. It's approaching a stationary distribution. That's right. Yeah. So the dynamic is basically, you know, um, I mean, it's fairly nicely formed in this particular case because I started the initial condition was, you know, very extreme. I mean, I started at this end, and so basically, what you're seeing is the fission process from here to here. This distribution is largely uh, due to the fission process of that giant curve at the beginning. But at the end, it's a stationary, it's a stationary distribution. It's a that depends on all the yep. Yeah. And the nice thing is, I mean, you do actually have a, you know, a, a, a prediction, which is nice. And it's, it's you know, you can arrive at that stationary distribution. So, you know, under kind of constant probabilities of, of splitting and joining, you know, that's the only condition in which you kind of get that sort of nice clean outcome according to that paper. But it does a pretty good job of, of capturing kind of the phenomena that, you know, we're talking about. No, 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 the stationary distribution, regardless of what you start with, it would end up there. That's it. Can you solve another equivalent that is thing for that? Yeah. Yeah, for the for that for the for constant condition. So if you know if beta and, and uh, alpha yeah. are actually density dependent, or you know some it's more complicated kind of relationships, no. Right, but but it, under this condition, you can at least it's an approximation. I think I have to go back to the paper, but it's, a, it's a, I think it's a very believable kind of uh, outcome. I mean, it's believable enough that I can do it. So that's you know it's not that bad. Uh, the rest of the conditions are terrible, and I would never begin to get close to it. But part of the reason for throwing this up, though, is there's people around here that do like this kind of yeah. and potentially could be, you know, an interesting thing to think about modifying those conditions and what that would mean. So here, for example, is the Thompson Gazelle beta, where I derived it from the total population size of 400,000 individuals that we know. From outside and uh, fitted basically uh, in relation to the uh, in relation to the negative exponential uh, parameters that we that I showed you from that earlier curve. So pretty decent fit, right? So you know my argument is it's not a bad way to start. If you're interested in in the distribution of, of groups and how that plays out in terms of ecology, this is not a bad starting point. Now, the reason why it's interesting is that, um, remember the, our second objective is to understand predation risk. And the reason why it's interesting is because when you have grouping, uh, the rate of encounter by the predator is very influenced by that grouping. 
if we work on the assumption that the predators have to sample in space. If you have closely associated individuals, that means that uh, they're not widely evenly distributed uh, in some sense in space. And so the rate at which a predator is going to encounter one of those groups is uh, influenced by the degree of grouping that occurs. And that translates into the alpha and beta parameters and the abundance of uh, individuals in the population uh, in a way that uh, changes the encounter rate and, and suppresses that encounter rate, uh, particularly when the population is large. So how do you generate this? So this, these parameters would be the ones from the previous graph. So I estimated the parameters, you know, uh, fr from that relationship, and then just show you that um, that I mean they enter in anyways the same way. It's not it's not difficult to see that basically that um, that deflection is it traces back to the degree to which you know they're um, splitting or or joining. Right, so how do you generate the the more than one Yeah, the, no, I encounter well the encounter rate I can estimate from other behavioral attributes. We know this is the encounter rate for a lion, and we know how much far it travels, what its what its perception range is, what its probability of attack is. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of things that basically go into it. We know the, the rate that the predator moves and how, how fast it searches space. This then is basically what, what the probability of uh, if encountering a group would be uh, in space. So, but the, but the model of the encounter that you're thinking for is that it's a random, it's, it's an ideal it's gas model. The ideal gas. That, yep, it's as if it's ideal gas, but you've got this, uh, you know, um, comp complex molecules move around instead of a you know, simple model. Well, because, you know, predation, I mean, encounter rate based on the ideal gas is very different from, you know, the real random. Could be, yeah, sometimes, I mean, sure, could be. And I mean, I'm not saying that it isn't. I'm just saying that this would be, the effect if you compared an ideal kind of prediction uh, when individuals are are in are solitary versus when they're grouped. That's all I'm showing. And the it holds up pretty well, anyways. Um, this is actually the kind of how this translates into risk. Then um, is that the, the, that that rate of encounter then is going to be uh, basically influence the uh, probability of of um, per capita mortality of an individual uh, because that rate of encounter being influenced by um, being influenced by the uh, distribution in space. So this is basically a cartoon that kind of, you know, kind of helps with that impression. So basically we have a single solitary predator uh, hunting solitary individuals on the left hand side. Here's the same sort of solitary predator moving, you know, um, with, with a random walk on the right hand side, but with grouped uh, prey. And that's kind of the intuition that I'm talking about. That rate of encounter, you can see, is pretty strongly shaped by uh, the fact that, that there's so much more empty space because they're actually uh, closely aggregated. Okay. What? They're more well, it just depends how you see things. I mean, we know we lions never capture anything farther than 100 meters away. We don't see them, you know, tracking across large bits of the plains after them. Like cheetahs? Well, cheetahs are a whole different thing. They, but by by and large, these are stealth predators, and they, you know, the, the only ones that you could. I don't think that that's a big uh, consideration. It may be a slight consideration. But at the kind of tenfold kind of effect that you can see here, um, probably tiny. Okay. Sorry, but if you could see a little bit farther, maybe you could double or triple yeah. or something like that. But I'm just saying that that's no, no, a lot of empty space. I, no, because the natural thing, you know, especially when you talk about as you go to a path, that's a patch for a predator. No? Sure. That would be the patch. And so then you see, if you're really hungry, you eat one, you eat another. Everybody's there. No? So, no, there's so, the, they, they can't though because it's no, like, there's a handling time. They, they the handling time, but you know, they, they go in group. Yeah. So they become much more efficient. The group can actually, you know, 
uh, in the group that that doesn't help. No, they still eat only one. No. Yeah, the whole group eats one, and by the time they finish, everybody else is gone because they're all mobile. I see. I, in fact, when a lion is eating, the rest of them couldn't care less. All the other ones that didn't get attacked are standing around, you know, eating grass. They just look over at the lions. They couldn't care less because they know the high lions are pretty on them. Yeah. So uh, the fixed handling time is a kind of an important thing. I'm, so there's a whole side of this that also relates to the predator. I'm not going to show you that, but I've been doing that too, right? And that's actually what I spend most of my time now on, the predator. The point I'm trying to make, though, is being in a group gives you escape in space that in a way that's actually meaningful. And that, that you know, that relationship is something you can work with. Anyway, so if we kind of apply that in a kind of luck couple terrorist story model, I'm not gonna show you all the details here. This is supposed to be a short talk, not a long talk. But, uh, the, uh, if you put the head into a luck couple terror thing, it's actually published this year earlier and you not look at it. Um, that it has pretty strong influences. That change in encounter rate uh, has pretty strong influence on the stability of the system. So here is this is basically a you know computer experiment where I changed the uh, the relationship between group size and population density. Uh, and population density is obviously sensitive to carrying capacity. So uh, and uh, group size and the density dependent effects. Are basically influenced by those parameters alpha and beta uh, or the um, parameters that are in the power pit. Just they're kind of the same basically. In any case, as you get larger herbivore group size on average, as the mean group size gets larger, it's stabilizing. And as that density dependent effect on the encounter rate gets stronger, it's stabilizing. So you have the kind of, you know, the periodic part of the, this, the parameter space shrinks and uh, you have growth both in the kind of unsustainable kind of uh, part of the parameter space and the stable part. But I mean, what it is doing is basically this acts as a damp, dampening kind of process on the tendency to uh, cyclic behavior that's kind of been built into, into these, these models. So it has important dynamic properties. Now, those properties are still based on the supposition that it's just a homogeneous population. So all this stuff I've talked about is still treating uh, a bunch of groups that are kind of randomly associated in a, you know, in space with a single population of predators. There is no kind of, you know, spatial kind of gradient or anything. But the point I'm trying to make is that you can kind of think of a, you know, a group dependent kind of depiction of, uh, of fitness that's basically framed around, you know, the food intake and how it translates into the energy. Uh, and how the group dependent kind of uh, loss rate uh, is, is uh, influenced with that frequency distribution of, of groups being kind of a key element that, uh, you know, uh, helps us to understand what the overall behavior would be. And finally, what I would like would be, you know, what I'd like to spend some time while I'm kind of around here would be to be thinking about, okay, so now let's think about this as a dynamic process in space, not just thinking about it as, as uh, something where we're looking at, at groups that are, uh, you know, in, in a uh, unchanging kind of landscape, but rather this is the distribution of Thompson gazelles from month to month. So it's, you know, it, it definitely is very dynamic in space. And it's tracking, you know, to some degree, the grass uh, availability that I showed you. And where they're kind of concentrated in that sweet spot where it's not too much grass, uh, not too little grass, but somewhere in between. So, what are the dots? So, the dots? Oh, these are these are the tracks that we use to, to count things. So, when we're driving, this, these are the this is where we sample animals, and then the rest is is basically uh, you know fitted to extrapolate it to to that. So they're not perfect data in the sense that you know we can sample perfectly, but um, but nonetheless, I think you know, they're consistent enough that it shows us that change occurs. Okay, so I mean, basically, what that's what I want to do is kind of you know plant the seed that look. I think there's some interesting things here uh, that link kind of uh, you know individual level dynamics where now the individual is part of a group 
So aggregation kind of properties as being something to think about in uh, spatial models. So I had heard anybody else talking about particles as kind of, you know, having a, a social kind of tendency. And it seemed to me that this, you know, might be worth thinking about because we do actually have a formalism to be, to be thinking about it with. Okay, when I first think so John, I mean, when I see a grid like this, you know, 400,000 is infinite, no? Yeah. So you're just integrating that from G from one to infinity. That, sure. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. Okay. So therefore you don't, I mean, so therefore your QG first part is just irrelevant. So you have an integral. That I'm just trying to emphasize that the fitness is being shaped by the frequency distribution of the individuals because of this term basically that i mean the other term is basically just a you know a game curve of some some sort uh, but they all vary in space so I, I mean i don't know maybe that's too much going on um maybe it maybe it isn't but it, it struck me as being kind of interesting and it you know maybe one could kind of break break this down and kind of treat this as constant or something like that and just think about you know the dynamics of uh, um you know the, the prediction rate or something it just seems to me that there's an opportunity here to kind of do some um some math that um you know could be interesting i can simulate lots of this stuff yeah. so i mean that's not a problem i mean i you know and that's you know i do do that sort of stuff and you know maybe that's what, what i end up doing here but it did strike me that there, there might be people that are interested in the kind of you know, trying to think more continuous ways to represent some of these things maybe in simplified form but uh, but I think that Garen and N model is actually sort of intriguing. You know? So I mean, coming back to what Ran was mentioning, you know, a bigger group is more difficult. Yeah. There, there are probably other things for which you become more, or, I mean, accused. I mean, like one animal leaves some cues, a bunch of them leaves much bigger, stronger cues. You know? And so are this predator able to follow these cues more effectively? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a predator, but uh, you know, okay. yeah. news for you. <laughs> we don't we don't see any particularly strong indication that that's what happens. I mean, you know, we have people that track these things all the time. Well, so probably, probably, uh, you know, cheetah they stand on the yeah, and lions do too. Yeah. yeah, lions do too. But they, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that that changes their rate of encounter. I mean, but by the time they walk a kilometer. The herd has moved, right? I mean, you know, and when they're on the ground, the, the distance you can see on the ground is actually quite different. You know, if you picture yourself down here and imagine how far you would see across a field of grass, maybe not so, as easy as you think. You're, a, you know, a taller kind of, you're looking down and often have uh, advantages. I, I think it's not necessarily as big a deal as, as, as you say. In any case, these models actually predict the rates of predation that we actually see. Whereas if you just take straight encounter, it's like an order of magnitude way too high. Because yeah, we really understand the parameters of encounter quite well. I mean, we know exactly the probability of success in hunting. We know how far they travel, it's 10 kilometers a day. We know that they never attack farther than uh, 100 meters away uh, with any success. Oh yeah. They just hide. Yeah, they go to what they hold. Yeah, and sit there. Yeah, no, that's right. It, it, you're quite right about that. Yeah, they, it, that is what happens often. Uh, with with it's saying, you're right. I mean, there are places where it's like that, but but, but they actually do actually have to uh, actively search things. In some ways, yeah. Yeah, but the own model also may be part of the global detection. Yeah, well, part of the reason for going to water holes is because you have very tall vegetation, so it's easier for them to hide out. But even if that's the case, it still doesn't change the model because, in a sense, you still basically, the probability of encounter is still based on the encounter of, of a group, right? So, um, so just what I mean, okay, sure. on the on when you have groups of mama. Because you know there is a confusion effect that people talk about, especially when you can see clearly fish. No, we have a group of fish. You know, yeah. it's this predator coming in, and it's like, whoa! You don't know which one to pick. Right? There's sort of similar effect here. Uh, I'm sure there is. 
Um, I think it's less dramatic than it is in the fish. Uh, but, you know, definitely the group scatters as soon as a predator attacks. And typically it's the slowest one that they're yes, going yeah. to get killed. And some, you know, often that would be the, you know, the youngest yeah. or, you know, an individual that's, that's with a broken leg or old. Uh, but even then, the probability of success is like 20%. It's not high. Sorry? It's pretty high. For, for so, so but it's not. Yeah. It, it, it roughly, when you have it like that. So, if you had such a successful grant, can you imagine? Yes. Oh, I see. Well, it's the same thing. If you if you if you join together, your success on grants goes up too. So <laughs> that is true. Yeah, that's the message. Yeah. From a theoretical point of view, one possible question is you put this, 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 this in the context of the fisher language. Yeah. What do you get? Uh, yeah. Are there still ways for speed to the moon? That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. Yeah. That it basically, because it's because it applies phenomenologically, all nine species kind of, okay, it's not a bad starting point that they, you know, that, that they're not, uh, that they're aggregated in space, right? So. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly the sort of thing I was thinking about. You know, kind of a simple, simple diffusion model matched with with the aggregation, yeah. which I think would be interesting. Yeah. Well, anyways, there you go. Thank you. Any other question? No. No. Okay. Thanks, John.